Dr. Farrell, thank you so much for taking the time to come in this Sunday morning. Always a pleasure, Rene. It is always good to see you, yeah. looking as healthy as possible. <laughs> as, as It looks as though you already did the savannah, you had a shower, uh, you <laughs> smiled, and you had breakfast, and you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. All right. Uh, you know, he didn't comment about the savannah. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, we are, we, we are in some difficult times. Uh, government's revenue for the first quarter of the 2017 fiscal year plunged by nearly 25% to uh, 7.98 billion compared to 11.22 billion in the same period uh, in the previous year. Uh, these numbers, of course, coming from the Central Bank March Economic Bulletin. The document indicates that the sharp fall in government revenue for the October to December 2016 period was due to a decline in both energy reserves and non-energy re, uh, receipts. Non-energy revenue fell by 29.1%. Uh, the first thing I would start is to ask you to do your usual, educate us, and when they refer to non Tax revenue. What does that mean? Uh, I, no, I think they mean non revenue re from out of the energy sector, from the non yes. energy sector. Yes. yes. So that mm -hmm. is all revenues that arise from outside of oil and gas and and petrochemicals. Uh, so it will be the, all the other companies and businesses and so on that generate. In fact, they generate the majority of government revenue. Mm. Um, but typically, the the oil and gas sector um, in times past would have accounted for as much as over twenty billion dollars of our of our fifty fifty five billion dollars of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, that has now dropped quite drastically to um, to to well. It <laughs> I, the number I see here, um, based on on the on the first quarter, is is less than four billion uh, for the first quarter of this year from the from the oil sector. So, mm -hmm. but but all of that, quite frankly, Rennie, is is expected. It, it, it is it is it is not. It should not be have been a surprise to um, to anybody. Certainly, mm. certainly not to the central bank or to the Ministry of Finance. Um, the the fact of the matter is that when you look at the production numbers for us, we see crude oil production is continuing to fall. Mm -hmm. We see natural gas production is continuing to fall, which means that the exports of those commodities are falling. We have a natural gas shortage in the country, which we've had for several years. That is also impacting the petrochemicals business. So we've seen recently that two of the MHTL plants have had to, to close down, and a third one possibly might, might close. Mm -hmm. uh, so the plants are on gas curtailment. They're not able to operate at full capacity, which means their revenues are down, which means that for tax revenues are going to be down. Uh, and that's that's simply the, the fact of the matter. I mean, I don't I don't think quite frankly anybody should be surprised at what we see. There are some areas of that that beg delineation. I'll come back to you yeah. on that as we go on this morning with the deficit between what the government earned and what it spent it was close to two point five billion dollars during the first quarter for uh, fiscal twenty seventeen. Are we to a see greater dislocation job wise uh, as the government um, moves to reduce its expenditure? Well, the thing is, the government has has I, I think um, reduced expenditure in in areas where it, it can I mean uh, but I, I I think and, and one thing that I've said um, going back um, <laughs> two years now is that there has to be a more concerted effort to cut government spending uh, um, we, we, we we have not at this point in time I was where we sit here in March of 2017 we have not yet effected the adjustments that we need to make on the fiscal side nor have we made the adjustments that we need on the balance of payment side. Mm. So on the balance of payments, we continue to lose foreign exchange reserves, and on the fiscal side, the government deficit is too large, and it is unsustainably large. You know, one of the areas um, that I should have I just pointed specifically to, because on the one hand, I know there is the desire to cut expenditure. I understand what you're saying, but there's also the need to trim the fat in the nation. Trimming yes. the fat becomes a difficult political uh, decision to make yes. because in trimming the fat, some people are going to be on the bread line. Yes. So my question should have been specifically, as the government moved to trim the fat, yes. are we to expect job loss and so on? Without question. I mean, I, I, that, that is to be expected. I mean, um, there, there, there have to be job losses. The government cannot continue to carry uh, um, people employed in the public sector mm. uh, because it simply does not have the revenues to be able to do so. So what we're seeing now, for example, we've recently had the announcement in respect to the tourism development company. Um, that company has to be restructured. Uh, it is an important organization. Obviously, the tourism 
uh, development company needs to continue to exist and to continue to do its work. Mm -hmm. But the, prob the problem with that organization, of mm -hmm. course, is mm -hmm. that it has become, mm -hmm. like many other state enterprises, has become bloated, too many too many people doing the wrong things. You are aware, of course, that the former minister of, um, of uh, I believe it would be tourism, made a statement today saying that the TDC never got the money they really wanted. He is speaking of, you have to band your belly, as it were, yes. and invest into something like the TDC. On one occasion, he said they asked for, I think it was in the last fiscal, they asked for three hundred million dollars, of which they were granted. This is in the previous yes. government. They asked for three hundred million dollars, and they were granted sixty-eight. So yes. the question of uh, they failed because of fat, or they failed because of a commitment and an understanding of the investment, is my question. They failed before for two reasons. One is that I think that the governments um, going back have not allocated sufficient resources to. Uh, areas like tourism areas that are going mm. to drive the diversification of the economy so that all of those agencies that have been responsible for those activities find themselves from year to year with all kinds of budget cuts which mm -hmm. means that their programs are not cannot be sustained in an effective fashion I hear you. but but secondly many of those state mm. enter enterprises and many of those agencies which are responsible for development and diversification have been misdirecting themselves. They have been doing things which, quite mm. frankly, are really not are not going to be particularly effective. Mm -hmm. So two things need to happen. One is that the government needs to have a budget for those activities which is ring-fenced, as I would put it, so that you can have a consistent and sustained effort in terms of development and diversification of the economy. Mm -hmm. And secondly, those agencies have to be redirected with a strategic mm. plan and strategic mm. intent which is clear and specific and makes sense. My guest this morning is economist Dr. Terence Farrell, the government, uh, the government minister that I re, uh, uh, spoke of, who I quoted uh, the numbers, was the former tourism uh, minister, Stephen Cadiz. Just yes. wanted to make sure uh, that we are clear there. The Central Bank uh, March Economic Bulletin states that there was a year-on-year -year decline of 7.7% 7 .7 in crude oil output in the second half of calendar 2016, and a 15.4% percent drop in natural gas production over the period. In addition, the production of both LNG and NGL, natural gas liquids, uh, was down with LNG, which is uh, liquid, liquefied natural right. gas, uh, falling by 16 percent. What is being done or what needs to be done, doctor, to stop this slide? Well, there are, there are two things that, that, are, that in fact are happening. One is that there's a set of, if you want to call it, a set of emergency programs which are taking place uh, to try to stem the, the decline. And that re relates to specifically the, the Juniper project, which the BP is now uh, activating, and mm -hmm. that should come on stream at the end of this year. Uh, there are some other smaller projects, uh, the truck project and so on, which will come on between 2017 and 2018. Then, as you know, there's the initiative in respect of getting Venezuelan gas from the Dragon Field, which is Venezuelan gas, and how we bring that gas, um, with the help of British Gas, mm -hmm. to the plants at Point Lisas. That That's another project which will take you probably into 2019, 2020, maybe 2021. And But longer term, we have to find new reserves of, of natural gas to be able to sustain our Point Lisas industries. So that takes you beyond that period. If we mm -hmm. do not find new reserves of natural gas, which means that you've got to start exploring uh, now and you've got to make those finds now because it takes four to five years to actually bring that gas on shore, uh, then we will experience again another sharp fall off in our gas production in 2020, 2021. We've been talking for a long time about increase in production, which means new exploration, which means new investment. Right, right. And um, uh, I, I don't know how viable it, it, it is or how attractive it is to those who are wishing to invest into our situation as, as freely as they may have been before with the advent of discoveries in both uh, Guyana yes. and, 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 of course, what's going on with the with the um, situation in Haiti because again we're mm -hmm. talking about fines there mm -hmm. and it is going to become I believe more difficult to attract the the majority yeah. of input uh, for exploration in the region are you concerned about that but well, well, I think I think we do have to be concerned the multinational corporations are not in love with Trinidad or Trinidadians <laughs> the multinational Just corporations the reserves. <laughs> look, look they look at their global <laughs> situation and they make investment decisions based on where they can, can maximize returns mm -hmm. now, one of the things that we have to remember is that the companies that operate here British Gas BP uh, Repsol those companies and so on are sort of traditional 
uh, players in the energy sector. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we have a whole new shift that has taken place in the energy sector over the course of the last years, where there's a shale oil revolution that has taken place in the United States. The United States is now a situ in, in a mm -hmm. situation where it is self-sufficient in respect of energy in terms of natural gas production and oil production. And an exporter. And may become an exporter. Mm -hmm. I think I think recently mm -hmm. they have been now permitted mm -hmm. to, to, to export. Mm -hmm. And that has changed the equation completely. It has taken the wind out of the sails of OPEC. OPEC's ability to, 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 to influence mm -hmm. prices in the market has been significantly reduced. Uh, so those of us, those Trinidadians who are sitting and praying for the price of oil to go back up, uh, so that we can continue what we've been doing and so on without changing anything, I, I, I think are uh, in for a very rude shock and surprise. It is a surprise that we must deal with because the finance minister from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the energy minister rather yes. from Saudi Arabia, just warned the United States. He made it very clear. We are not going to sit here and yes. try to prop up the price mm -hmm. to accommodate your shale exploration. He's right. saying if you go and you flood the market with your shale, we mm -hmm. will flood the market and the prices will go down. Yes. That is where I think the concern for Trinidad and Tobago comes precisely, in here. Precisely. We are price taker. We can't influence the price at all. Uh, and, and the possibility that the price falling back into the, it's not already back down into the 40s, uh, falling even further as the market, as these two contending forces um, try, try to work out who is going to win, mm -hmm. uh, that we are going to be the, 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 the ants that get trampled by the elephants in that process. It's instructive that our listeners keep in mind, uh, Dr. Economist uh, F uh, Terence Farrell is my guest. It's interesting that this battle we talk about, uh, this titanic battle, as it were, is something that is real. It was uh, OPEC. Yes. who said to the shale explorers uh, 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 just before two years ago, yes. if you continue this, we will put you out of business. Yes. And they did, because yes. OPEC um, flooded the market. Yes. Yes. Uh, everybody was able to yes. stock up, and the shale producers found it uneconomical to continue. Some of them did. But then what has happened with the shale producers is that they have responded in, in, in a quite remarkable way in terms of new technology. Mm -hmm. So that in, this course, in, in the course of the last two years, what has happened is that many shale producers in the United States have gone bankrupt. But many of them have adapted to the situation. Mm. They have changed the technology, and they are now able to produce tight oil and tight gas at a much lower cost point. It is true to uh, say then that OPEC no longer wields the influence it did, or it must make room to accommodate this new power. I think that that is how the market is in fact going to shake out. Saudi Arabia's uh, um, uh, um, energy minister also went on to say that uh, even though there may be a, a, a f further availability on the market, yes. the developing world, Asia and yeah. the developing world, he said, are going to continue at the pace they are, and there will be greater and greater need mm -hmm. uh, for more oil on the market. Is that a sort of balancing um, consideration? Um, I, I, I don't think so. In the if you, if we take the scenario out 10 to 15 years, mm -hmm. I think that the Paris Accord in respect of climate change is going to limit that upside. So therefore, I think that what is going to happen is that while it is that countries like India and China and so on, China, for example, has a massive pollution problem mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the, the production of hydrocarbons and yep. coal and so on. So they are going to change. They are going to move to renewables. Mm. And I think many countries, I, I think even the United States, not, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, that President Trump has said that he's probably not going to follow Obama's policy in respect of climate change and so on, I think that he eventually will come around to recognizing that this thing is real mm -hmm. and the United States is does in fact have to sign on to that program, which means at the end of the day that hydrocarbon production, crude oil, is going to end in another 15 years and natural gas is going to end maybe 20 years from, from mm. the day. So therefore, in those circumstances, I quite frankly, I do mm. not see prices getting back up to the levels that they were prior to the financial crisis. We were fortunate that we were able to see prices go up as much as 50 because, uh, as we both um, stated, as the as the facts state, the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration raised its 2017 U.S. crude output forecast to 9.2 million barrels per day. Right. Prior, it was 8.98. Right. So as far as availability in the market, it is going to be there. Maybe it is true to say the Soviet, Saudi Arabian foreign minister is speaking optimistically. <laughs> yes. uh, it, it's, so so, so it's an awakening for Trinidad and Tobago, and part of, of that awakening is what's going on right now with the methanol holding uh, Trinidad Limited. Right. The unavailability of gas to them, and they are not the only ones, yes. is something that is very worrying. What is the economic impact of this shortage? You said looking at what can come from the Dragon's Mouth and other initiatives in there, we may be looking at three years down the road. In the short term, speak yes. to me what we are looking at. Well, the most, what we can do in the short term is that we can try to maintain current levels of natural gas production 
at about 3.8 BCS. That's what we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are, this, 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 this country consumes somewhere between 3.8 and 4.2 BCF, and that's, that's what we've been working with for the last several years. If, if those Juniper projects, as well as the Venezuelan gas and so on, allows us to maintain that, then we can hold things together. Mm -hmm. But remember, all of these gas and oil fields and so on deplete at varying rates, which range from 10%, in some cases up to 25%. So you have to find and can replace the reserves that you have. And that means further exploration, further investment in exploration, and then bringing the, 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 the fines to shore. Uh, and, and that's a process which, as I said, could take four to five years. In the limited time we have, we're extracting as much as we can. Sounds almost like an oil initiative. Uh, extracting <laughs> as much <laughs> as we can right. from economist Dr. Terence Farrell, who's the chairman of the Economic Development Advisory Board and former governor of the Central Bank. Truly a pleasure to have you here. The question of political consideration, the issue of this location, and some of the decisions that must be taken in lieu of what we have said, one, with oil prices, two, with the future of oil, uh, three, the export uh, giant that's emerging, which is the United States, it means we have to look at things very differently, which means the models must be changed. It takes me straight to a Petrotrin situation. Petrotrin, uh, as the minister um, j just revealed, it lost $4.2 billion. It has raised many questions of privatization. That option, how viable is it in lieu of, of, of what we talked about with the impact it will have on jobs, etc. Well, I don't think that privatization, quite frankly, is an option for Petrotrin that should be considered seriously. And my reason for saying that is that the, 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 the country has a strategic interest in having a state-owned energy player that is a significant player. Uh, I, I, my, my, that's my own view. I think, mm -hmm. I think so. Therefore, I, it, is not a, it is not an entity that I would look to privatize. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is an entity, however, which is in dire need of restructuring. Petrotrin is inefficient. They have made some very bad decisions in the course of the last four or five years, which are paying the price for that now and causing those losses. Oil prices are down and so on, so they are in a lot of trouble. Just that uh, we be very clear, doc, uh, yeah. Doctor, if I ask you to put a pin there just for yes. a second, sounds like my mother, I'll stick a pin there, yes. as she would say, you, just to differentiate. On the one hand, there is a production issue. On yes. the other hand, there is a mismanagement problem. Correct. You are pointing as though, it sounds to me, like you are pointing more to a management problem being the bigger adverse um, hinge in this equation. Yes. Because quite, frankly, because, quite frankly, the production issue and the fall in price mm. issue is something which affects all companies. BP is affected, BG is <laughs> affected, <laughs> and mm -hmm. all of them have mm. made adjustments to their successful circumstances. Uh, so, that, so that companies cut, uh, they've laid off staff, and they've cut back production, mm. they've re re looked at their investments, and so on. That's what companies do. Companies with good management do that, and that's what Petrotrain also does. But Petrotrain has a problem, and the problem with Petrotrain has been poor management mm. over the course of the last many years. So I'm, I'm saying that one of the, in terms of the restructuring process for Petrotrain, that one of the things that the company can look at is not privatizing Petrotrain, that is to say put it in the hands of the private sector, but Petrotrain may perhaps need to look for partners mm. in respect of particular uh, initiatives. For example, the Trinmar fields that you have, Petrotrin may need to get a partner to work on developing the Trinma project. Mm. The, the, the land mm. uh, fields that they have, um, that which uh, we, we've done the far, lease operation and farm out programs, we need to do more of that so we can have smaller private sector producers and so on get into those fields and increase production on land. And then offshore, I think I don't see that Petrotrin should be really looking to go offshore into deep water because I don't really have the capability to do that. But I think that they can look for partnerships, but mm. without being privatized in order to turn things around. The company. This is a partnership you're talking about with independent operators. With, in, with independent operators on the, for land mm. production. Mm -hmm. And in respect of Trinmar, I suspect that you will probably need to get a foreign company to partner with Petrotrin. Give me a sneak peek. Venezuela, an option? No. No, no. Why not? PDVSA is 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 has completely collapsed, um, and PDVSA is the only company in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that so that uh, no, I don't I don't see mm -hmm. any Venezuelan company. I would I would think that probably one of the multinationals. It doesn't have to be a top tier multinational, but one of the other maybe mid tier multinationals. Trinma is not a very big field, mm -hmm. uh, but but you do need to bring expertise and so on to to bear on, on increasing trade mass production. You are one of the most uh, fervent advocates for the CCJ, so I want to go there. Just before I step into that door, let me yeah. conclude uh, this economic discussion. Uh, thus, uh, looking at what everyone talks about, diversification, what is the primary product 
you see Trinidad and Tobago? I know it's a, it's a combination of different components, mm -hmm. but what is the primary area uh, where we should put uh, uh, our money thrust um, that you think will assist in bringing revenue to not replace, but at least contribute towards minimizing the shortfall from oil? But uh, when I say first, two things. One is that, first of all, diversification is a long-term yes. project. So we are talking 10 mm. to 15 years. It mm -hmm. is not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I don't think that we are talking about one area or two areas. In fact, one of the things that we have tried to do is that we have put to the government, we have put mm. to the government a document that identifies seven broad areas that we should focus on uh, and, 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 and make the investments in those particular areas. And, they, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad range of areas. So we are saying that we are not looking for to hit the ball over the fence for sixes, or we're not looking to create another point leases. What we are looking to do is that we are looking to pick up the ones and the mm. twos. As I keep saying, we want to play a Larry Gomes type of innings, build an innings, and so on. But you see, that has to be sustainably funded by uh, where, where government support and financing is required it has to be done on a sustainable basis and we are not doing that in respect of government budgeting priorities and so on very interesting uh, analogy of larry gomes you didn't say oscar durity oscar <laughs> would, would hit all singles at least larry would pick up a twos and a three <laughs> now the terrence uh, farrell is my guest this morning um I, I actually missed that. Uh, doctor, I want to go to the CCJ yes. because I know I only have a short uh, time of seven minutes remaining with you. Um, the Attorney General, um, uh, Mr. Rawi, his leg legislative agenda, um, I think, can be helped by the adoption of the CCJ yeah. um, only because in the appeal process, you can get cases moved faster. However, last week, uh, my guest, criminal attorney and ILP leader, Rika Ramjit, said many of the le in the legal profession feared the susceptibility of interference of the CCJ is one reason for apprehension, and it should go to a referendum as the suspicion she believes and her colleagues is widespread. How but, do you respond to that? Well, that is an utter non sequitur. I mean, um, how, I don't know how a referendum solves the problem. <laughs> if you think that the problem is a susceptibility, how a referendum solves that mm. problem. We have no provision in our constitution for referendum. Let's start there. Uh, secondly, this is an issue that is that is that has been addressed over and over. In fact, the Law Association has taken it upon itself under under Reggie Amo as president to in fact mm. conduct a series of of of, um, of, of, of of seminars. The latest one was done in South Trinidad, mm -hmm. and at that presentation, Martin Daly, who has been a member of the Regional Legal Services Commission, dealt specifically with the issue. Of the susceptibility, or the, uh, or the, or the, or the, or the independence of the judges mm. who are appointed to mm. CG. In other words, the appointment process, how that mm. is done, and the fact that these judges are in fact insulated from the political directorate in the region. I don't know, quite frankly, how anybody mm. who has looked at the issue, who has looked at how the thing operates and how it has been set up, how the, the trust fund has been set up for the CGJ, could make that argument with a straight face. Mm. They can't make the argument with mm. a straight face. The referendum argument is a red herring, quite frankly. And we, we have also seen the experience that we've had with referenda. If you, if, you, if you look at the Brexit situation, for example, you find a, a situation where 52% of your population has decided to go a particular direction, 48% has said they don't want to go, and you are going with all kinds of costs and consequences as a result of, 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 a, of a kind of marginal decision. And like it's that. called a buyer's remorse. Your federation would uh, exactly. also give you an example of that. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. so, exactly right. so, so, so the CCJ, do you, have you, are you feeling as an advocate uh, you, you, yourself uh, are you feeling there is a commitment from the present government to see the uh, the, 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 the acceptance uh, uh, of the CCJ well, as well, the I, final I think that that is true because number one the Prime Minister said that mm -hmm. when he was mm -hmm. before he was Prime Minister number two I believe it's in the PNM manifesto that they will sign on the CCJ and so therefore I think it's government policy mm -hmm. that this administration has a commitment to signing on to the Caribbean Court of Justice the, the, there is an, a, an opposition to the CCJ the opposition is in it's, it's very in Kuwait quite frankly they do not articulate it to my mind very openly and I would say in an intellectually honest fashion what their real reasons are for objecting to the CCC. There is a Bob Marley um, theory that I will bring in here. Um, 
<laughs> Mental slavery, removing yourself from the yoke, the <laughs> comfort of the of the prior masters being in a better position to make an independent judgment. One of the arguments put forward is that they are not so close to the region and as such um, <clears throat> uh, least likely to be corrupt and or have an independent view. There is also the other side of that. They say that by them being this far away, they are not familiar with the nuances right, of the region. Right, that's right. Exactly right. That's right. And and, and the, the arguments of the Law Association brought, we brought a, a justice from, from India who talked about what they had done. Uh, we brought uh, Mr. Robinson, who is on the ICJ, mm. and he talked, he's a Jamaican actually, who is on the International, uh, uh, the United Nations International uh, Court of Justice and so on, who made the case that, look, quite frankly, uh, it is it is the, the, mm. the in independence of our judges, the quality of our judges that we have mm -hmm. is without question. And therefore, the arguments that I hear, or, or quite frankly, are uh, not very well articulated for remaining under the jurisdiction of the mm -hmm. Privy Council, I think, quite frankly, don't stand up. Well, just to make it clear, because I never make swipes at my guest, uh, when I referred to my guest last week, who uh, was a variation, it had nothing to do with that Bob Marley comment, but I will come back to, with that comment to you, because mm -hmm. as, um, <clears throat> as raw as some will deem it, there have been others who have said that is exactly the problem. Mm -hmm. Our um, reluctance yes. to cut the umbilical cord yes. with London because of the perception yes. that that number of years out there, that maturity is in some way or the other superior yes. to what we can we can put in its place. And, and then the answer to that is quite clearly no. I I, I, I think <laughs> so. And it is a, it is a, it is a kind of part of it is a kind of an arrogance of uh, about English jurisprudence. Um, that English jurisprudence is somehow better than, than, than say, European jurisprudence mm -hmm. or Australian jurisprudence and so on. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think that that, 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 stands, that, 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 that holds water at all. Uh, and we do have a problem of, uh, you call it mental slavery and so on. We do have a problem of these kind of colonial attitudes which have continued and so on into our society. But let me tell you, Rennie, I think I have spoken to a lot of our senior attorneys mm -hmm. in this country, people who are senior counsel and so on, many of them who initially had taken that position because that's what they grew up, they, that's what they understood. They've appeared before the Privy Council mm -hmm. and they're quite happy to, 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 to continue that and so on. And many of them have changed their minds and changed their perspective on the issue. But there remains a group of attorneys, I think in particular, um, in this country who continue to hold that position. And I am not quite certain what the reason for, for that is. I will I will go beyond that small chuckle in your <laughs> voice. <laughs> I will go past that and in conclusion uh, ask you if you are aware of what is necessary via the participation of the of the opposition in making uh, the adoption of this CCJ law in Trinidad and Tobago because I'm wondering if, if an opposition is going to come from that side yes. is is that a, 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 a well, it is necessary it, you, you you are going to need the the three fifths majority you are, three -fifths. definitely mm -hmm. yes so mm -hmm. the opposition is going to have to support Yes. Ooh. Uh, Marley said, I throw my corn, me not corn, no foul. I, <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. Dr. Ter Terence Farrell, the economist, I thank you so much for taking up your time to be here this morning. And I hope to see you again very soon. And maybe well, the next time around, I will um, get the reserve of at least an hour so we can yes. actually go into, go in into summer, some in, detail in, absolutely, of yes. the number of um, issues on, that are economic us. issues. There are many difficult economic issues that we are facing. And I'd be happy to sit down and talk it at length with you. And for that, I thank you. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. Not, so you have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much.